Well, good evening. Um, you probably heard yesterday uh, one of your colleagues, investigative reporter Hossam Bahgat, was uh, detained and arrested, and nobody knows his whereabouts right now. I guess my question to you is, uh, what would you tell Hossam if he can hear you now, aside from the mock radio, what advice would you have for him? Um, and uh, I guess the second part of my question is, what can we do not just as Egyptian Canadians, but as citizens in this country to help Hossam and help journalists facing this situation. Hossam Bakat is a, a frontline, very good journalist in Egypt and a human rights defender. And he's done some of the best investigative work for, as an Egyptian. Uh, and yesterday was a very sad day for me uh, to find out that he has been called in and interrogated by the military. Uh, prosecutor, which is a huge debate in Egypt anyway, that a civilian to be interrogated in a military prosecution. It's a huge deal and part of the demands of the Jan 25 revolution that was on top of that list, but it didn't happen. But the point here, I would tell Hossam, if he's hearing me now, as you ask, that every organization in the world that cares about press freedoms is out there fighting for him. There's a grassroots campaign in Egypt brewing, and I'm seeing it, and I'm seeing, I'm seeing all the names, and I know all the names that are working on it. And me, myself, today, I woke up in the morning, and there were so many emails from people who wanted advice on what to do and whatnot, but he, he needs, he, you know, this sort of support is what's going to um, protect him, uh, because he, I, I, I know exactly what he's going through right now. It's a very dark and scary position to be, no matter how many conflict zones you've covered. You uh, being in that cell is very hard. And I believe that he has been um, questioned or brought in due to a report he wrote um, against that sort of criticized the military. And so, you know, God be with him. It's a, it's a, tough, it's a tough one. Yeah. As a uh, radio host myself, uh, it's very interesting that you actually put on mock uh, interviews with Al-Qaeda and <laughs> ISIS. That's very interesting and very unique access there. Um, anyway, my point was, uh, my question was, uh, you very briefly mentioned the Prime Minister, Har former Prime Minister Harper uh, in this. Did you feel abandoned by Prime Minister Harper and foreign affairs in Canada? I refused to believe that in the beginning. Um, but there was a point where I felt that um, the government um, in, in Ottawa uh, abandoned my um, you know, constant requests for direct intervention. Um, we sent a, a very detailed email, for example, to Mr. Harper's government uh, asking him to uh, meet Mr. Sisi in the UNGA in 2014 and present him with a letter that specifies my health situation, which was not good, and to ask for a health um, pardon. Um, the, they acknowledged receiving the request, but it never happened. So you just tried everything. we tried everything. We tried when you are in this situation, you're like a drowning man. You need any, any, anyone that comes to you with that hand, you, you need it. Your parents need it. You're, you need it. You need it to get out of prison to a hospital. You need it to get a bed. You need it to be deported back to your country. You need it before you're sentenced once and twice. So I am very passionate about helping others right now. There are two Canadian journalists uh, abroad, Mr. Hussein uh, in um, in China and Mr. Bashir in uh, Ethiopia, and there are other Canadians who are um, not journalists, but they're abroad in prisons right now. And there is, you know, and, and I believe, and I'm lucky that I'm in Canada back in this era of change and hope, and I'm inspired uh, by Mr. Trudeau's and the meeting I had with him, and I feel that he's going to bring a new energy and he's going to bring this, this sort of, uh, uh, positive change and clout that will bring Canada back as a um, a nation to be, um, you know, uh, to listen to 
because there was this one point where I felt from the grapevine of the Egyptian officials that, eh, you know, Canada's our friend and, you know, we'll deal with it later, this sort of attitude. Well, you know, um, yeah, you know, next time, next time. You know? And so I, I, I honestly feel that, uh, again, I said it, the Canadian ambassadors on the ground were shackled by the decisions in Ottawa, and I respect them so much, and they have become an integral part of you know, the family for two years. They're visiting you, they got me maple syrup, and they got me <laughs> newspapers, and they, they were in contact regularly with my you family. You asked for the maple syrup. You know? Yeah. I asked for the maple syrup, but they got me the magazines and the books. That was, that was nice. And um, the books were very meaningful, because I did survive in prison by reading books like um, Man's Search for Meaning, you know, you know Mr. Viktor Frankl. Um, survivor of the Holocaust, and reading about the Auschwitz and his experience in prison made me sound like, well, you know what? Maybe I'm in Club Med, you know? <laughs> but it was it, not, not, yeah, you know, I, I know, he inspired me, you know, how to turn this suffering into, you know, tragic optimism, how to, how to, how to turn it into your, a, an achievement, a self-achievement for everybody, and people who are tweeting and making it, you know, a positive uh, mark in your life. And I still live with this, uh, way of thought today when I wake up in the morning. Um, and I believe his book has left a mark on me. And um, I've read uh, Nelson Mandela's book uh, in uh, prison. And when you read it in prison, it's a little different than when you read it in the park, <laughs> basically, <laughs> The Road to Freedom, you know, and uh, other books that really inspired me. So um, the Canadian ambassador was bringing me most of these books. So Let me just ask you something before we go to the next question yeah. about that. It's a lot of Canadian journalists have observed that if an American is taken into custody or arrested or finds himself in a jam, the American government will move heaven and earth to, move it, to get an American citizen out. Bill Clinton flies off to, to North Korea and brings people back personally. But the Canadian government just seems more detached. And I, I, there's no empirical, Ambassador Bell might know more about it than I do, but, but there's, it's not an empirical observation. It's just, it just seems that we're further from our governments, and the Americans are closer to their governments. You're, this is an area that you advocate in. Are American journalists, do they have a better time of it abroad than the rest of us when they get into trouble? Um, because the NGO workers that were arrested in Egypt got out in an awful hurry. The NGO workers, and I covered the story extensively for CNN, it happened at a time when, this, when the military was running the country, as the security, it was a different time, and they, were, they, they, they flied out, they flew them out, and um, uh, you know, the, the Americans, uh, and again, it happened with Mohammed Sultan, when he dropped his Egyptian citizenship and he was deported uh, back to the States. Um, you know, I, I can't draw direct uh, comparisons, but I do believe that the U.S. Um, sometimes, because of its position as a country that pledges Egypt $1.5 million a year in aid and military aid, they may have more say or more clout. And because an but, Americans and Americans and Americans. You know, Abraham. but America also has a no negotiation or ransom paying That's uh, true. That's true. Um, That's policy true. towards citizens and yeah. kidnapped in, uh, in Syria, and that yeah. could have meant... Uh, uh, you know, yeah. something for Sotloff, my friend. So, we'll yeah. take a question here. Go ahead. Hi, um, uh, I'm from Egypt, and um, in Egypt, there is El Sisi and his crew, and uh, there is the Muslim Brotherhood, who both, in my opinion, don't genuinely care about uh, my country and who are following their selfish interests. And there's also a, some individual people who genuinely care about the country and where it's going. Do you know of any group of people, whether it's a political party or just a group of people, who genuinely care about the country and wanted to move forward? Yeah, they're all in prison. And do, you, <laughs> <laughs> and do you want to identify them? I was gonna ask you that. Names or what the name of the group is or the name of people or? Yeah. It's, it's interesting how you, I, 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 I knew you're Egyptian again from your uh, demeanor. But um, <laughs> no, I, um, um, you know, there was always the third, you know, they had, you know, the, the people who are against the military and against the Muslim Brotherhood. And this, you know, third group that um, was mostly um, comprised of, you know, the youth that started the, 
that sparked the Jan 25 revolution, April 6, and group that really um, you know, was a catalyst during the revolution, and other groups who continue to call for true democratic change and are willing to continue the battle. And, um, but unfortunately, they, after the Mubarak stepped down, there was, they were not organized enough. And that's what happened when the, and the Muslim Brotherhood were very organized and were they very, they were very um, you know, um, uh, good at rallying people and supporting their people. And I've done stories, I've seen them in the slums, how they had this organized uh, teams of providing medicine. And so that's why I think they flourished. But they didn't really, uh, yeah, after the one year they were gone. But there are groups on the ground, but it's becoming really hard with this crackdown on dissent. It's becoming you know, um, you know, hard for everybody, Western journalists, uh, anyone who is just has a different view on how to do things than how the government is doing it. So um, I, um, I sit here in Canada, in Vancouver, in the greenery and the picturesque scene, but my eyes are always on the Middle East, and it's a subject very close to my heart, and I feel very bad because ev almost every day in the morning I wake up, I'm seeing people I know who are being imprisoned, killed, or you know, silenced. So to answer your question, many good people out there, but it takes bravery to do it, man. And, and you were saying to Ambassador Bell before we started that the current regime is a, a lot more oppressive than the Mubarak regime was, and the Mubarak regime was, was you know, that was you who said that. No, it was Ambassador Bell who said that, and you That was you who said that. And, <laughs> and, 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 you know. <laughs> what do you think about that? Um, you covered both. I covered the, uh, I've been yeah. there for both. Yeah. Um, I think it's very, these guys very. Are, these guys are putting up, are, are setting a whole new standard, aren't they? Yeah, no, I think it's very different times. The terrorism of the 90s during Mubarak that was called the black terrorism, it wasn't as, as advanced as what we're seeing now. And, um, Right now, the terrorism is unbelievably powerful, and there the terrorists are using terrorists or extremists. What are we gonna <laughs> You're the one that's talking. Yeah, they're using social media better than the governments are doing. They're winning the social media war. They're more engaged. They the connectivity makes it even harder. So, drawing the comparison between the Mubarak regime and what's happening now may not be the best way to go. However, right now things are looking bleak. Um, but I am still hopeful, believe it or not. I am hopeful that um, somehow, some way, Egypt will get you know, uh, a better democratic uh, state. And uh, I know there, there's parliamentary elections. But again, I always say it, and I even said it on Egyptian TV. There's nothing that I, uh, you know, my wife is always worried about what I say and whatnot when we were there. But I was saying it that in order for Egypt to be able to promote this new democratic image, they need to respect press freedom, civil liberties, and release some of these people that are in prison unjustly the same way I was released. And I praised the Egyptian government and thanked them, and uh, my lawyers did as well, for releasing me and this new spirit of reconciliation. But more people need to be released because there are more innocent people behind bars that were swept during this um, uh, mm. Yeah. Security sweep. Go ahead. Good evening. I would like, um, having heard about how you had to give up your Egyptian citizenship, how, what's your opinion on Bill C-24? So Canada being able to strip citizens of their Oh, that citizenship. is not good at all. No, I freaked out when I uh, heard about <laughs> C-24. I was like, come on, what am I going to walk around with? I mean, you're going to strip all these citizens. <laughs> yeah, the ambassador thankfully brought me, I asked for the literature, and I read it in prison. The article, the actual bill, and I was very concerned. I think it's um, very dangerous. It uh, gives a minister the right to strip you of your citizenship, and it overrides the judiciary and due process. Um, yes, indeed, there is people out there who are pulling the trigger, but they're also innocent journalists. And tomorrow, another Canadian dual citizen could be caught up in a case similar like mine, um, and it would be very um, devastating to strip him of his citizenship. So I think it needs to be revisited. I hope it's revisited by the new government um, because it's a very, very dangerous law, I think. I don't think it's new. Canada, I think, did that with war criminals, didn't they? I believe yeah. they did it with Nazi war criminals. Anyway, go ahead. 
Hi. So before I get to my question, I just want to say I think it's very inspiring the fact that you can be very good humored about this and forward looking as opposed to just playing the blame game and talking about why what happened happened. So that, I think that's very, mm -hmm. very impressive. Um, so my question is that if you had the ear of the decision makers who influence or make the decisions about Canada's national security policy, what would you warn them about or recommend based on the experience that you went through, aside from uh, the point that you made about the fact that they're possibly pro producing terrorists by mm -hmm. just imprisoning them? Thank you very much. Um, humor is very important. On the front line, sometimes you're at a border and you're spending 10 hours waiting for something to happen. And suddenly, so you need humor to survive on the field. And we had to use humor as well in prison to survive because you know, uh, you can't just uh, be down and out all the time. Um, so, um, and there were very funny moments in the, in the trial itself. You know, you, you're seeing the judge showing photos of me and President Morsi in the palace as evidence against me, and me and Zawahri, and I'm saying- You and the democratically elected president Exactly. Of Egypt. So I'm telling him, so I told the judge, sir, this is an exclusive I am proud of this work. Thank you for showing my work to the courtroom. I, I, I would tell the judge this, and I was trying to use humor in the court to break the ice and make the, you know, and show the Egyptian press that how this is almost a joke, and the judge sometimes, I'd catch him, we'd all catch him smirking or like breaking down, you know, and trying to resist. Before he sent you back to prison. Before I sent me back to prison. How many, I don't know how many times, but you know. Um, so, yeah, humor is, is important. Is there any point really in addressing? I, I, I read about that and the things that you said to the judge, but yeah. what's the point? I mean, this, this is a country in which a judge sentenced 700 people to death at one, yeah. in one fell swoop yeah. for an attack on a police station. I mean, is there any point in talking to the judge? The judge is obviously not there to, to administer impartial justice. I mean, what's, I, I, I found there was almost a plaintive note of what you were saying to him because really the people that are making the decisions are not sitting on that bench. Uh, yeah, and it was, very, it was very tough also seeing a lot of these people on death row living with you in prison and just seeing how they deal with it and that scene of them you know, wearing the red suits. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a very tough um, experience. And, uh, but I do believe that it did make a difference. Hard to uh, measure it, but speaking to the judge, I think, did make a difference. Because you are now um, also trying to influence the public opinion in Egypt. And like it or not, the public opinion does influence the judge. So you're going after the press, and that's your only chance to speak to the press when you're in court. And you can't speak to them. They you know soundproofed your cage. Yeah, they soundproofed our cage way after that, because I have a big mouth sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, and, you know, but yeah, before that, we would always have these you know, mini press conferences and interjections in the court. And you know, you're, you, it was so absurd at times that you know, you, your blood pressure would just pop up and well, you couldn't it believe absurd. it. I mean, the yeah, whole procedure yeah, was, a, yeah, they didn't completely. bring any evidence forward against you. Yeah, you know, just evidence about licenses and issues that should not be taken in a criminal court. Um, but, but there they, was no evidence. Yeah, there's no evidence. No evidence to uh, support terrorism, fabrication. On the contrary, the technical committee that viewed our videos came back and told the, the judge, there's no fabrication. So it was a tough battle, but you have to put up a fight. And you have to put up a fight on both on different levels, public relations, media, uh, and in court. Yeah. And the, 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 the you, the journalists supporting us. I don't think, I think the Canadian press was, it, they did an impeccable job because a lot of the Canadian press was being translated into Egyptian press every day. Some of the tweets mm -hmm. and, you know, so it did make a difference what was being said here. It influenced the, the media there, I think. And the but me the, the media there yeah. bought that you were a terrorist and, and accused you of that until they didn't at a certain point, right? Yeah, they switched gears 100%. It was unbelievable. The Somebody same, must have told them to. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't think it was. It, was it, it wasn't like that. It was our hard work behind the scenes. You uh, lo lo yeah, I know. Uh, my wife lobbying uh, and the way we positioned ourselves, we, you know, that, okay. You know, so now we were sending these media advisories to all the press in Egypt, uh, telling them who this person is, what he's doing, you know, and we were now, my wife and my family became activists, lawyers, ambassadors. They were everything. And it was a battle on every ground. You have a rhetoric for the West, rhetoric for local press, 
you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it was incredible. And you know, I have Egyptian lawyers, I have Canadian lawyers, I have Amal Clooney on the other side. Uh, lobbying where the other lawyers weren't lobbying. Al Jazeera was not lobbying with my captors. I mean, so she was talking to the Egyptian ambassadors in Washington, in London, speaking to the presidency, telling them he's not a Muslim Brotherhood. And ironically, I protested against the Muslim Brotherhood. When I had three months between my job from CNN and Al Jazeera, me and my wife went down on the street and we called for early elections. We wanted early elections and I was able to take my journalism cap off and as a private citizen, uh, chant. And then when I went back to the job, you know, took a step back, and I continued doing my job uh, with complete objectivity. But of course, the Egyptian government had another plan for us. So that's what it is. This question up there. And I know there's a part where I didn't answer. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, and, 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 and. About influencing policy. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Excuse me for that. I don't know why I went on a tangent. <laughs> no, I, I spoke at the police force a couple of days ago in Vancouver, and the, the speech was, was mostly about that. You know? I think step one is recognizing that social media is a, a, a weapon that the extremists are really good at using. You know, these, these armies they have for recruitment, they feed on... Um, you know, teenagers who have a bit of an identity crisis and they're looking for answers about Islam and this is when they get them and they sort of lure them in and it's an easy ticket to Turkey as a porous border into Syria and you're in, you're in this adventure land that they try to sell you. But also, so I think when I was talking to the police force, I told them, you know, social media is very, very important, very powerful, but also establishing, um, you know, an approach that is not, is not just related to security. It, there has to be a way of um, finding an alternative um, in terms of, um, I, I can't say starting a dialogue with these people because some of them, you know, it's a no, it's a, a place you can't even go, but trying to, uh, trying to address the problem in its, in its roots by um, you know, looking at these youth, uh, by providing um, you know, an alternative to uh, these youth who are who are, who who are just you know steering away and getting becoming easy targets, that I think that's something important that the Canadian government should realize from 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 now immediately. Yeah. This fellow's been waiting. Hello. So you were lucky because you have another citizenship, which was the Canadian. But there are still hundreds, maybe thousands, uh, journalists and reporters in prison in Egypt or all around the Middle East. Uh, who they are still in prison because they don't have that dual citizenship. So is there any movement to free them or will they stay in the prison forever because they don't have a dual citizenship? And uh, what should we do as a youth teenagers, uh, sorry, youth uh, Egyptian here in Canada or everywhere in the world? It is true so. that reporters, there is a lot of reporters rotting in prisons who weren't getting the attention that you got. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. Tawan, Egyptian Tawan. I spot you anywhere you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's very easy. <laughs> now, um, Committee to Protect Journalists says there are 18, journal 20 journalists right now. 20, yeah. And others say there are more behind closed bars. And uh, I think this confusion is because of um, uh, the issue that some of these journalists were caught while they're doing their job on the street and others were caught or char and, and charged of being Muslim Brotherhood members, but they happen to be journalists. So, who's, who's a journalist? You know? Right, I mean, the bloggers, and El Menar is a journalist. Yeah, institution and, 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 that, and that debate comes in the equation yeah. as well. I mean, who, 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 you know, the citizen journalist and all that, but, you know. Um, so, of course, my, the attention I got and my teams got was because we worked for a big network that uh, and um, we were in as international journalists. We've had uh, more support from the international uh, journalism community. I've never seen such unity when CNN, BBC, and you know how journalists are so competitive. You have CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, and ITN, and others all coming together on one single day, yeah. and you know going dark screens, and you know um, just the, this doesn't happen mm -hmm. ever. That was a pretty effective hashtag, too. And the hashtag was pretty impressive. So um, it's tough leaving these journalists. We all wrote about it, and we're really glad because you came back. Thank you. 
Yeah. I was going to answer a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I think, I think, you know, and it, it, every day, every day, the, I, I, I live with this sort of question. I'm not going to say it's guilt. I'm going to say it's question in my mind. What happens? I mean, and I'm advocating for Shaukan, who's an Egyptian photographer, who was there for two years, and he, he still hasn't been, he's finally been put on court, in court, and he's going to be in court. So I think, and I say this everywhere, the best person that understands his case is the defendant, more than anyone. You know? And I think people now, our case has inspired others in Egypt, and I see all these groups now are coming together and using the social media and these uh, Twitter storms, all these free press campaigners are coming together and they're even collaborating with uh, NGOs like Amnesty and trying this sort of, this sort of uh, Twitter storm. They start on West Coast time and East Coast time and Japan. They all start at the same time to send that message to the governments that everybody is vouching for this guy. You have letters that are being signed by prominent journalists. You have uh, coordinated protests across the globe at the same time. You have um, you know, op-eds that people are writing. So I think it's, it's a collaboration, and that's what worked for me. Uh, there's no way of saying that I was released because of my dual citizenship or because Amal Clooney did it when she came to Egypt. It's all one big effort. And it has finally culminated with my presence in this room. <laughs> there is, th there was a woman in uh, Bahrain who was sending out regular bulletins about the crushing of dissent by the Bahraini government, assisted by the Saudis who ruled. Mariam Khawaja. Right, exactly. Yeah. And I didn't see an awful lot of what she was communicating arising in the mainstream press. She didn't, none of the people that she was advocating for got a scintilla of the attention that you got. And I suspect that there are people in similar conditions various places in the world. I mean, your case was a, quite, was a special case. I'm not quite sure why. No, it's, uh, I'll tell you why. Because of the geopolitical issue between Egypt and Qatar, number one. Number two, and because Egypt has been in the press for such a long time with all these hopes and dreams of change and revolution and uh, this debate, was it a revolution or a coup? And, you know, and so basically it's, it's, it's because of the intensity of this location of Egypt as a state of 90 million people compared to Bahrain's uh, uh, 3 million, 4 million people. Million. Yeah, something. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm no, sorry, you're right, you're be, right. Six, yeah, six. Like six million. And uh, the presence of the U.S. Fifth fleet. And the fifth fleet. Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so basically, I think uh, it's the timing uh, of this upheaval and, you know, the ouster of the Muslim Brotherhood. And we were, you know, we were right there. You know, the last story I reported on air for about half an hour was on December 24th. And it's very ironic. I was reporting that the Muslim Brotherhood has been designated as a, ter as a terrorist group at 3 a.m. in the morning. And then I put my phone down, I went to sleep. And then four days later, the cops knocked on the door. And I looked at the, in the hole, and there was a waiter, you know, the old waiter uh, trick. With the sandwiches. Yeah, the sandwiches, <laughs> yeah. So I opened the door, and suddenly there's a dozen uh, officers barge in. And one of them is rolling a video camera. And the other guy is snapping photos. And immediately, it was placed on television. And before I even reached the police station, it was being reported that they caught a terrorist. No interrogation, nothing. So. That's and, and the story was just very dramatic all the time, you know, the and you know, so many first times. The first time that they picked up and perpetuated by your fellow Egyptian journalists. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, it's a very challenging case. What and do you make of that? Of what? The fact that they that the journalistic community in Egypt turned against you so fast. Uh, um, I, I think, you know They did what they were told. Um, I don't think it's told, but it's the general uh, mood that, you know, you are Al Jazeera, you are Qatar, you are Muslim Brotherhood, so that's the general mood. And that's the same thing with people who ask me, uh, do you think the president called the judge and told him to give you seven years the first time? I say no. I don't think the president does that. I think what happens are the judges are all operating on this, um, you know, idea that you know, they need to crush anything that's Muslim Brotherhood. And that's the same thing goes for Saudi Arabia and the UAE, who joined Egypt and declared the group as terrorists, um, while others didn't. So I, I think it's more of you know, and pleasing the, and the presidency. And they're also on the lookout for the devil. And the devil. The devil is always a problem. <laughs> Go ahead. 
Hi there, Mr. Fahmy. My name is Amanda Connolly. I cover uh, foreign policy and security for iPolitics.ca. I'm wondering if you could go back and not have taken the job in Cairo, not gone through what you went through, would you? He wants to go back. <laughs> <laughs> um, I took the job and I expected my employer to be transparent with me the same way any employer should be. So I would take the job again, but I would sure hope that my employer would be more transparent with me and allow me to take the decision based on information that is true. And um, I don't think I would work with Al Jazeera if I knew their broadcast license is not in place. I mean, it's okay sometimes journalists, you know, you forget to renew your press pass. It's like your driver's license. You pay your ticket, you know, and you go and get, and get mm -hmm. it. But this is the broadcast license. So I think I would, you know, I wouldn't have accepted if I knew that. That's one. And uh, two, um, I wasn't really happy as well when they started using my material on the Arabic channel, which was shut down by a court order. So um, although I did ask all these questions and I got confirmations in writing, um, you know, that's what I would do differently, to be Go honest. from the English managers or the, or the Arabic managers at Al Jazeera? Because a lot of those English managers were experienced British and Canadian journalists, were they not? Uh, the English managers, a lot of them are uh, British and Canadian, but the people I dealt with uh, were um, of Arab uh, origin. But uh, English has a different management, Arabic has a different management, but the head is the director general. But the ones you had the issue with? They were the English. Uh, branch. But it's, uh, it's, it's not the issue of the nationality. It's just, you know, the, 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 that, again, I do believe that there needs to be new legislations and charters that protect journalists across the world from prosecution. But I also do believe that part of calling for free, free press is that corporations and media organizations should also respect the laws um, of these countries where they operate from and provide a good security umbrella for their teams on the ground. Is it, fair to say, is it fair to say you think that they cut you loose? Oh, I've, uh, they, they definitely, uh, it, was a sh it was a sinking ship when I took it over. And it was bobbing in the sea and we had no uh, watchtower. Uh, and I tried my best and my team did really good job, but you know, you were not being told what's going on in the background. And that's something very important I want to say here that's not very prominent in the media as well. Um, Al Jazeera had warnings, but they didn't listen because uh, of the Riyadh agreement. You know, and the Riyadh agreement was brokered by King Abdullah before he died. And that was the agreement concerning how Al Jazeera would behave. The Riyadh agreement was brokered by King, Saudi King Abdullah between Kuwait, between the UAE, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar. And part of this agreement stated, and Mr. the Sheikh Tamim, the head of Qatar, signed and agreed that Al Jazeera Arabic would review its hypercritical programming of these Arab states in Egypt. Um, and it also, uh, he also signed that Qatar would stop uh, hosting uh, Muslim Brotherhood fugitives that are wanted in Egypt and stop supporting some of the extremist groups on the ground in Syria and Libya. But the part that really resonated with me was the Al Jazeera part. You know, you are a network, the Arabic network. You, you promote your uh, slogan as the opinion and the other opinion. You're hypercritical of these Arab countries, but you're not covering the lack of political parties in, uh, in Qatar, the lack of press freedoms, and the lack of uh, labor unions, for example. I doubt for, there's been very much coverage in Al Jazeera of the guy that wrote the poem. No, there was one website story. Yeah. yeah that's right. Good evening. My name's Sarah. I'm in the legal studies department here at Carleton, and I'm looking at counterinsurgency reform. Uh, so I'm sure you're following the Raqqa as being silent. Uh, slaughtered silently movement in Syria. And so my question is um, them being a group reporting inside Syria, they're acting in acknowledgement that they don't have any protections or rights and freedoms. And I'm wondering if this is indicative of the protection or lack thereof that journalists can expect in the Middle East. So their, com their, their issues are about inside Syria, right? Yeah. Right. 
Oh, I mean, uh, th bias. thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think Syria is uh, probably the most dangerous place in the world right now to operate. Um, and and uh, me personally, um, I am working on a project, but I'm not uh, uh, ready yet to announce it um, that uh, deals with Syrian uh, journalists and uh, the danger that they face on the ground. Um, I'm very proud of the new government that, they, that they're, they've announced they will host 20, 25,000 Syrian refugees. Um, and I'm working on a project to assist some of these people. Um, so with, through my foundation. Um, but you know, I, th I think you know, the S Syrian journalists are probably getting worse, worse uh, situation right now. I, who are you, are you talking about the group that is surreptitiously documenting ISIS? Yeah, so there's Syria? about the, 20 the people young... people upload the video. Right, about 20 yeah. young men. They have a Facebook and Twitter yeah. account, and yeah. they just report about what's happening on the streets, and they're all hidden, so some of them are d being disguised as women, and mm -hmm. they're around between the ages of 20 and 25, so they're not actually reporters, but they're working as basically the only reporters left there. Mm -hmm. That's high-risk journalism. Mm -hmm. That's that, that's high-risk journalism, but it's also, um, um, you know, it's incredibly borderline citizen journalism. It's brave, but this is something um, that's a very sensitive topic because there's this uh, networks are now relying uh, more and more on uh, methods like such as that to cover the story, which is uh, good, but it's also sometimes misused. You know, it's interesting you say that because the, the teams because on the ground. CBC has had this problem, and all mainstream media organizations, something pops up on YouTube. Well, do you use it? I mean, who knows, right? I can it, write a book on this. Exactly. And it, it, it really and so bothers So what me. we do now is we say, well, you know, we haven't authenticated these pictures, but they seem to sort of look like they were from Aleppo or wherever. Yeah. But it's just, it's gone, it's gotten to the point where there's an awful lot of stuff. I know who you're talking about. Those people are remarkably courageous, but we have no idea how they're operating or what they're doing or who they are. But the issue, uh, The issue from a national security perspective, and it's very hard when you start debating it with intelligence officers or police officers. They'll tell you, well, OK, so even if you're vetting it, you're getting this material from a group that is an opposition or a terrorism. So you are now crossing the line of journalism, and you're dealing with this group whom we are trying to, to arrest. Um, so it becomes very, very sensitive uh, to deal with the material they bring uh, and not being questioned. Um, and that thin line between journalism and activism is something to watch for to protect uh, journalists and networks from these uh, accusations. Except some of the most spectacular material and the most revealing material has been Samistat yeah. material from those people. Of course, of course. Go ahead. Hi, my uh, question brings us back to Canada, actually. So earlier this evening, you said that you don't believe there is true freedom of the press anywhere in the world, and Neil McDonald said, well, we, the Western media, think we have freedom of the press. Um, so where do you think Canada stands in that respect, and what That's could be improved question. here? That's a really good question. <laughs> and you know, I, I've been under a rock for two years, so I've missed a lot <laughs> of what was happening. I can't, um, you know. Uh, but you know, I, I mean, of course, um, the, the media atmosphere here I see is very inspiring, and I, I, I feel that um, uh, I, you know, even seeing CBC on the ground and, and other networks, uh, Canadian networks on the ground in the Middle East, I think they operate with uh, transparency, and uh, I do understand that the former government was uh, not as friendly to journalists as should be. Um, friendly. <laughs> I mean, we, we're not supposed to be friendly with any government, no. but, uh, and the governments usually, you know, share the same feeling, but I do feel that um, the journalists here were not getting the enough support in terms of resources and uh, support from the former government, but, you know, I, um, I, you know, I, I'm very hopeful with the new government here. Um, but I am very concerned about C-51, as I mentioned, and um, I just hope it gets better for all of us. And what would be really interesting yeah. to see is how the Canadian press media, which was so critical of the American media's patriotic correctness post 
will ever react if there is a serious attack in Canada. Mm. I think that would be the ultimate test, and I'm not sure we would pass because we're probably more scared of our audience than we are of the government. Mm. And when the expectations of the audience are, you know, you must say these things, mm. it's hard to stand up to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I agree. I mean, um, um, I don't know if I answered your question, but um, it's it's a very sensitive topic. And but I, 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 you know, I love the Canadian media. I mean, I am sold. I mean, they part of the reason why I'm we sitting here you. today is the Canadian media. <laughs> we got two more questions, uh, and we've got just a couple of minutes left. Yeah. So let's keep the question tight and the answer tight. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Hansa Chaudhry, and I'm first year journalism here. And just going back to your uh, conversation about words that they use, such as uh, extremists or terrorists or jihadists, um, I grew up in a like a Muslim household, and the word jihad to me has always just meant like a struggle of some sort. And some and Arabic isn't even like my language at all. I don't understand it. It's not my first language. But sometimes when I hear these words on TV, I kind of cringe, and I'm like, but that's not what. I was taught, you know, that's not what mm. I think it meant. So my question to you is, Arabic being a language that you excel in, do you think, like, do you ever kind of, like, step back and you're like, wait, but that's not, like, what it means in Arabic, you know, the way that they're portraying it in the Western media? My understanding of the word jihad, according to uh, the Quran, is that uh, when you are being attacked, and your nation is being attacked, or your country is being attacked, or your family is being attacked, your response um, uh, is um, considered jihad, or you know you are now um, you know obliged, or uh, it justifies your response. Um, uh, so the problem here is that uh, you know the way it's being um, manipulated and justified and the way some of these um, sheikhs interpret it to younger uh, people and I've seen it in prison where they have these madrasas in the prison itself and they're you know, s preaching to these young um, uh, prisoners so you know and others say you know using jihad with your pen jihad with your camera jihad with your weapon and um, you know uh, I'm, I'm not going to get into uh, when it's justified and when it's not, but um, you know every network has its own way and language linguistic. Uh, <laughs> but labels are important. Book. But labels are important. So uh, something that really concerns me, and uh, uh, Al Jazeera, for example, had an interview. Uh, an exclusive with the head of Al Nusra Front, which is um, pretty much an offshoot of Al Qaeda, and they called the guy they're interviewing a, a rebel leader. And I wow. tweeted that day. I was still out on bail, and I tweeted that day. And I, I know tweets are coming like almost like the news wires now for journalists. You know, you, usually, you'd wake up in the morning, check Reuters and AP before going on to do a story. I Me, mean, I wake up, I'm checking Twitter. You know, before the, the wires, it's, it's, you know, and I was like, the UN, the US, and half the, most of the countries in the world are calling Jabhat al-Nusra as terrorists, but Al Jazeera is calling it a rebel group, you know. And so, again, the labels are important, of course, and Fighters. it depends who, who, who's calling the shots in the network, and, you know, sometimes the journalists pay the price, um, but, um, Again, you know, imprisoning journalists is not the way to go, and you know, thank you. That's a complicated question. Yeah, I mean, we can I, spend an hour. We can talk about it so later. We'll, for we'll sure. take one more it's, question. Okay, it can be a debate in a classroom, or I can talk about it some other time. Thank I you. have all the answers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he has everything. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Lucia, and actually, I'm a Malaysian student here in Carlton. I'd just like to know um, what do you think can be done to help countries that are facing heavy media oppression in countries that are not so mentioned in international media? And how do you think journalists play a role in fostering change in countries that are facing media oppression? I think, I think um, <clears throat> that uh, you know, this, this new epidemic uh, is being covered pretty widely now from Mexico and, uh, and the, the amount of and the journalists that are being killed there for covering the drug lords to the, in Bangladesh and, 
and India and these areas where in, 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 South, in Asia where they're being killed uh, again for blogging and for uh, expressing their, free, their, their, their uh, views. And the Middle East is definitely on top of the list. And Turkey is always in the news about that. So I think that um, journalists are now more sensitive and very aware that you need to immediately get on the story um, to, to make sure that you're protecting first this, this guy on the floor in that cell. But also, I think that in our case, for example, the sort of solidarity that happened sent a very clear message to world leaders that if you imprison journalists, every single uh, organization and journalists out there is coming after you. And I got to tell you um, that you know, when the Egyptian president, president traveled to the UN, you'd find people there ready to, you know, to speak to him. When he goes to uh, France or uh, you know, um, the annual uh, general assembly, there's always these armies of people who are putting it out there. And uh, organizations like Amnesty, uh, Committee to Protect Journalists, people don't realize what these organizations do. They are so powerful as NGOs that are neutral, but they're also fighting for these people behind bars. And, not, and governments know that very well. And it's very interesting how uh, these NGOs, I worked, for example, in the ICRC for one year, ironically, as a, as a prison uh, protection delegate. For one year as a stint. And it was the opposite of what I did for journalism. I had in to Lebanon. Keep, in Lebanon yeah. in 2007, I had to keep my mouth shut. But my job was to go to these cells and visit these prisoners and make sure they're not being tortured, they're getting food, legal aid, and report this to the, the prison and the country and not speak to the media. That's why I didn't last. I spent, <laughs> I spent one year doing that job. But that watchdog approach is very important by NGOs, by um, uh, the media, and the, the citizen who's on the net, who is aware of uh, global issues, to make sure that this person behind the closed bars is not uh, forgotten. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I wish you all the best in your return to Egypt. Thank you.